Uh, to present God's word to you this day. Uh, the title of my sermon is Wisdom Crieth Out. And we're going to be looking at chapter 8 together. And, you know, to really do justice to chapter 8, it would, it would probably take us till about 3 o'clock. So settle in. Just kidding. <laughs> I think. <clears throat> so, wisdom crieth out. You know, God's wisdom is, is seen in the, his works of creation, his work of preservation, and his work of redemption. His wisdom has his own glory as its goal. Psalm 46.10, for example, says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Isaiah 42.8 4, I am the Lord, I am Jehovah. That is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. So that goal of his glory is achieved in three ways, as we've mentioned. First, God achieves that goal through creation, by creating an awesome array of creatures and people. Psalm 104.24 O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy glory. Jeremiah ten twelve. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom. And hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Secondly, his wisdom is shown in his preservation. His works of kind providences of all sorts. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 145. Psalm 145. And we'll look at verses 13 through 16. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raises up all those that are bound down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and in all his works. Also in Acts chapter 14, Paul was speaking <clears throat> to pagans here. So God's acts of providence extend to both believers and to unbelievers. Of course, his greatest, his best, is for us as believers. But even unbelievers are enjoying his kindness, else they'd already be in hell. Else would we have been as well. Acts chapter 14 Verse 17. Nevertheless, he, that's God, left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. The third way in which God proclaims his wisdom and, and therefore uh, brings himself glory is by the redemptive wisdom of Christ crucified. We can see that in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through chapter 2, verse 16. And through the resulting body of Christ, that's us, the church, in the world today. You can see that in Ephesians 6, 10. Now as we look at our chapter and as you read through the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified as a woman. In chapter 1, she is seen as a street, street preacher crying out for humanity to stop and listen. Her basic message is clear and direct. We need to make a choice. We need to make, make a choice between two different ways of living, diametrically opposed. Wisdom versus folly. And the same coin, the flip side, Righteousness versus wickedness. Wisdom and righteousness go together. Folly and wickedness 
go together. Two ways of living. A stark contrast. Wisdom is crying out. You need to make a choice. We need to make a choice before it's too late. She offers instructions on how to live as God desires, and she provides both temporal and eternal benefits. So let's listen as she reveals insights into herself and invites us to enjoy her excellent things. Let's listen as she cries out. Now, where did wisdom come from? Well, wisdom is an attribute of God and is revealed to us in part in creation by the pre-incarnate Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. As we looked at our passage today, we saw that. Just a few verses. Verse 22, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I brought forth. So God used wisdom, the triune God used wisdom to plan and to execute creation. And it was done mainly through the person of the pre-incarnate Christ. Look at verse 32. We see also wisdom's authority. Now therefore hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. God always makes positive promises and negative promises. In this case, a positive one. If we listen to wisdom, we're going to, we're going to be blessed if we keep her ways. It's a good reason to, to listen. Of course, ultimately, all authority comes from, from God through Jesus. Don't have time today, but if you wish to, to study this, look at Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 4. Look at Colossians chapter 2, 1 through 3, and Colossians 1, 15 through 18. The point in Colossians is that in all things, Christ may have the preeminence. That Christ was the creator, that through him, everything was made. Through him, everything sustained. Christ had wisdom because Christ is God and wisdom is an attribute of God. So in other words, we ought to be paying paying attention as Miss Wisdom cries out to us. So what is wisdom teaching? Well, there's a number of things here that wisdom has to teach us. Look at verse 5. So she's in the first four verses saying, here I am, I'm crying out, I'm at the top of the hill. Everyone should be able to hear and see me. Pay attention. Oh, ye simple ones, verse 5, oh, ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. You naive ones, you ones who don't have wisdom and you want it. Pay attention. So, What is one of the first things that wisdom can teach us? It can teach us prudence. Look at verse also, verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and fill out knowledge of witty inventions. Witty inventions. That brings to mind the idea of shrewdness as well. So prudence, what's that? Well, prudence teaches us to be wisely cautious in practical affairs. Now, some things like prudence, I guess, can be learned, but through experience. You know, I, I remember years ago, I took a class down to Florida for senior trip and uh, warned them on several occasions, you know, that we're closer to the, you know, I remember I was a science teacher, we're closer to the Tropic of Cancer, that means the sun's rays are gonna be more direct, you can more easily burn. Oh, no, I never burn. Never, 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 I never burn. Oh, I think you should put some sunscreen on. Oh, no, Mr. McCoy, you old fuddy-duddy you. I don't need any of that stuff. Well, they didn't listen. They weren't prudent. 
And at the end of the day, they were lobsters. They were in quite a lot of pain. I felt like rubbing it in. <laughs> I probably did a little bit. But, um, and they eventually admitted to me, yes, you were right, Mr. McCoy. We should have listened. They weren't prudent. That's not a good way to learn prudence. And frankly, all these characteristics of wisdom, if we try to learn them in our own strength, through our own intellect, we'll have partial success, but we'll never exhibit truly godly prudence. We'll never live in a way that's pleasing to God. We need his strength. We need to be in Christ in order for these character traits of God, these character traits of wisdom to be in our lives. Look at Proverbs chapter 1 verse 14. Take a moment to look at that. Proverbs 1 14. Forgot I was at the pulpit for a moment. I almost asked someone to read it. <clears throat> That's not what I want. I want chapter, uh, verse 4. Proverbs 1, 4. To give subtly, subtlety to the simple and to the young man knowledge and discretion. That's the purpose of wisdom, the purpose of prudence here. It points us to being shrewd. In other words, we can become clever and astute in practical matters through godly wisdom. Let's look at some examples in the book of Proverbs. Turn, if you would, please, to chapter 12. Verse 16. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covers, covereth shame. So this tells us that the prudent control their tempers and they overlook slights. Look at Proverbs 12, 23. A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of a fool's proclaimeth foolishness. customer service, sometimes people tell me all sorts of things that I really don't need to hear <laughs> about their lives. You know, they, they don't know when it's right to speak and when it's right to be silent. There are times when we shouldn't speak. There's times when we shouldn't reveal all that we know. God can give us prudence to know when to speak and what to say. Proverbs 14.8 the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of the fools is, is deceit. The prudent can discern the path of life. They can learn how to live godly in Christ Jesus. Where fools indeed fool themselves. There is a way that seem right, seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof are death. Same chapter, verse 15. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. God can keep us from being gullible. God can keep us from being taken in. We can learn to think critically. Look at Proverbs 22, verse 3. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple, the fool, pass on and they're punished. God can give us prudence to see danger afar off, to plan ahead. And of course, most importantly, to foresee spiritual shipwreck. To understand our need of a savior. Secondly, in verse 5, wisdom teaches us to have an understanding heart. An understanding heart has a few qualities like discernment, like empathy, and thorough knowledge. Discernment means to have good judgment, 
Solomon asked for a discerning heart so that he could execute justice and equity in, in the land of Israel. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. And let's start with verse 21. <clears throat> the wise in heart shall be called prudent, and sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it. But the instruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. Pleasant words are as an honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. We see here that understanding is a wellspring of life. Are we deep wells bringing forth life to others? modern parlance? Are we a fountain or a drain? Are we up? Are we down? We can bring a wellspring of life. We have the words of truth. We have the words of everlasting life to share with others. We can inform. We can encourage each other. We can empathize with others as well. God can give us understanding hearts to be able to do all these things, to minister to the needs of others. Proverbs 19.8 tells us that one who has an understanding heart loves and nurtures his soul with good. Are we nurturing our soul with good? You know, what they say about computers, garbage in, garbage out. What are we putting in our souls? If we have an understanding heart, we're going to be putting things in that are good nurturing our souls, loving our souls. Proverbs 3.19 tells us that God used wisdom and understanding to make the earth and the heavens. He made everything. You know what? God understands physics. He made all the laws of physics. He understands geometry. He understands chemistry. Students, he can make you understand those things too. He can give you the ability. Have you asked him? The things that you struggle with, the things that we struggle to understand as adults, have we asked for understanding hearts? He'll help us to better understand his creation because by understanding his creation, that's one of his means of revelation of himself. It helps us to understand him too. Luke 24, 20, 45 tells us that the best way to know God is through his word. Let's look at that one. The best way to know God is, is through his word, and, and he can help us understand it. Luke 24, 45. <clears throat> Speaking of Jesus, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. Do we ask our Lord to help us understand the scripture, to have an understanding heart that we might know him, that his Holy Spirit would illumine us? All we need to do is ask. He'll give us a yes answer. Turn, if you would, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. moment on the first Timothy. Second Timothy chapter two, verse <clears throat> excuse me, verse seven. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. While we're in the towards the back of our Bibles, turn to first John chapter five. Verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Jesus can give us an understanding of 
what is true that places us in him gives us the means of having assurance of our salvation we should show we have understanding that we have an understanding heart that we have knowledge as well by showing a good conversation in his works with meekness and wisdom turn if you would to Colossians chapter 1 Colossians chapter 1 now here's an excellent prayer request that we should be praying for ourselves and for each other Colossians chapter 1 I'm just going to read it quickly but here's a great prayer request that we should be praying for each other picking it up in verse 9 for this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding why that you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of in light who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through the forgiveness of sins even the forgiveness of excuse me even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible god the firstborn of every creature for by him were all things created that are in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers all things were created by him and for him he is before all things and by him all things consist that's one long sentence it's one long prayer request let's be praying for each other that we might be filled with knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that may we walk that we might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing fruitful in every good work and increasing the knowledge of God thirdly in verse 6 we see that wisdom teaches us excellent things not mediocre things not merely good things excellent things that word excellent could also be translated princely you know we're a that we're members of royalty that we're a royal priesthood we have access to things of royalty the best of the best God wants us to learn his best turn if you would please to Proverbs chapter 22 Proverbs chapter 22 we'll pick it up in verse 20 have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge this is wisdom speaking again have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge and by the way this passage and the, and the remaining passages uh, in those verses there's 30 excellent things there Throughout the book of Proverbs, there's all sorts of excellent things. Excellent pieces of wisdom for us. For example, verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. that has of course temporal meanings but it also has eternal meaning do we have a good reputation with God if that's so that's better than being rich better than gold and silver it's an excellent thing in verse 7 the fourth thing that wisdom teaches us is truth Pilate asked what is truth Jesus didn't answer because he is truth truth is that on, on which we can utterly trust. That is that which we can rely on to the greatest decree, degree. We can trust our souls to God's truth. You know, truth and wisdom go together. Jesus told us he's the truth. God's word is declared to be the truth. In Genesis 24, 48, we read that Abraham's servant relied on God to lead him 
to a fitting wife for Isaac. We're told that the way of truth led him to Rebekah. Psalm 40, 11, the second half. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. The way of truth preserves us. The way of truth would tell us, don't go into that store and rob it. It preserves us from trouble. But it preserves us, even more importantly, from hell and death. The victory of death over us. Yes, we may die, but Death has been swallowed up in victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. Truth preserves and protects us. Psalm 91.4, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Ephesians 6.4 tells us that truth is part of God's armor for us. Protects our soft, gushy organs down here, doesn't it? We're supposed to be girt about. Our loins are supposed to be girt about with truth. Zechariah 8.26 tells us that our word is to be reliable. That's part of truth, isn't it? If we say we're going to do something, we're going to do it. Even if it's to our hurt. You know, sometimes we say something, and oh, well, that was stupid. I shouldn't have said that. Well, if you can't get the other party to agree, then you need to carry it out. People need to be able to rely on our word. Every word of God is yea and amen. We can rely on it absolutely. Are we reliable? We're to speak truth to our neighbors. However, Ephesians 4, 5 tells us to speak the truth in love. You know, I was a high school teacher and junior high teacher for many years and also a fifth grade teacher. And throughout all those ages and grades, very often students would say nasty things to or about each other. And if they said it in my earshot, I would challenge them. And often, you know what their defense was? But it's true. Maybe so. Who appointed you to proclaim that truth? And are you violating the principle that we're to speak the truth in love? Do we gossip? And as our defense, well, it's true. He did do that. Who proclaimed you to be the prophet of that truth? We're supposed to speak the truth in love. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Picking up in ver- chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Now, yes, this is describing pastors and elders, but we're all supposed to be servants of the Lord, are we not? We're all supposed to be able to proclaim the truth. Well, how are we supposed to do that? Verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. We need to speak the truth to others in love. In hopes that they will, like us, escape the snare of the devil. Fifthly, wisdom teaches us to hate wickedness. Did you know God hates things? Oh, God is love. He can't hate. God does hate some things, and he hates wickedness. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 97, verse 10. Psalm 97, verse 10. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. 
Why? He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Psalm 34, 14 tells us, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Amos 5, 14 and 15. A. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord God of hosts shall be with you. Hate the evil. Love the good. Psalm 119, 104. Hate every false way. Psalm 119, 163. Hate and abhor lying. Romans 12, 9. Abhor evil. Cling to that which is good. And yet Romans 12, 17, and 8 tell, tells us, 18 tells us, while we're abhorring evil and clinging to that which is good, that we are to repay no one evil for evil. Sixthly, wisdom teaches us righteousness. In verse 8. Righteousness is defined as moral living, which means obedience to God's law. The aim is to cultivate right relationships between God, people, and creation. Romans 12, 18, if it be possible, within the, now I'm adding this, within the parameters of godliness, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Psalm 11, 7, the Lord is righteous, he loves righteousness and fellowships with the righteous. Psalm 89, 16 tells us the righteous are exalted by God in his righteousness. Why live in a way that's pleasing to God? Why do what's right? Because God's righteousness is going to be, through Jesus, is imputed to us and we will be exalted. We'll be lifted up. And that will be in heaven. Psalm 111.3 tells us that God's work is honorable and glorious. His righteousness endureth forever. Proverbs 11.19 As righteousness tendeth to life, so that he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. Remember, two roads, two paths. Righteousness leads to life. Wickedness leads to death. Proverbs 13, 6. Righteousness keeps or protects the upright, but wickedness overthrows the wicked. Proverbs 10, 2. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. Why is it so easy to sin? Because it's pleasant, usually. It gives treasures, things that we enjoy. But they're temporary and they're deceitful. Our various sins should be like a cigarette package. Warning, smoking this will cause you to get cancer. Warning, doing this will eventually kill you forever. In agony, in hellfire. Sin doesn't come with a warning label, but our the Word of God does. The Word of God tells us treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivereth from death. Ephesians 6 4 again tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Heart and lungs are protected by the breastplate of righteousness. Our other organs, by the girdle of truth. John 1, John 1 28 teaches us that practicing righteousness in our lives, if we're doing it through the strength of God rather than our own effort, brings assurance of salvation. Seventhly, wisdom teaches us discretion. Discretion refers to tactful, being tactful and circumspect in our conduct and speech. It can also refer to being resourceful. Proverbs 2, 11, and 12 tells us that discretion preserves us and delivers us from, the, from following the path of the evil and of the scornful. The scornful are those that, that have heard wisdom's cry and said, forget it. I'm going to do it my way. God has said, okay, fine. But your way is going to bring you to death. That's the scornful. Proverbs 19.11, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Discretion makes us slow to anger, able to overcome slights. Ephesians 5.5 5 commands us to walk circumspectly, not as fools, 
redeeming the time. Why? Because the days are evil. Matthew 10, 15, Jesus tells us that we are sheep among wolves. So we should be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We're to be discreet. Eighthly, in verse 13, wisdom teaches us to fear the Lord. Proverbs 1.7 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the foundation or starting point for true knowledge. Proverbs 2.5 says that the fear of the Lord is also not only our foundation, but is also our goal. The wise person is awed by God and continually seeks to know him better. Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. Here, wisdom warns us of the trap of trying to accomplish wisdom, accomplish holy living, accomplish anything that is godly through our own intellect and reason alone. That's a trap. It's part of the deceit of, of Satan. We need to trust the Lord with all our heart and lean not unto our own understanding. What will happen in all thy ways, acknowledge him. And what, what's true? He will direct our paths. We need to fear the Lord and depart from evil. The fear of the Lord is, is life-affirming in, in very practical ways. Proverbs 3.8 tells us that the fear of the Lord shall bring health to thine abel and marrow to thy bones. You want a peaceful life? You want temporal prosperity? Do you want health to your navel and marrow to your bones? Well, the general promises of God are that, yeah, you'll get all these things through godly living. That God will bless you. Verse, now, wisdom's value. We've seen all that it teaches. Well, what's the value of wisdom? Well, first of all, 18a of our passage tells us that wisdom yields riches and honor. Proverbs 3.16 says, Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand, riches and honor. So, in normal circumstances, righteous living allows us to live long lives. We're not doing foolish things that are going to get us killed, like robbing banks, doing other crimes. But be careful here. This is not the prosperity gospel. God is not promising every Christian can expect to be rich on earth. In fact, look at the second half of, of that verse, if you would. Let's look at Proverbs uh, 8.18. Riches and honor are with me. But he doesn't stop there, or she doesn't stop there. Yea, durable riches and righteousness. What's that mean? It means riches that will last for eternity. What did Jesus say? Don't lay up treasures here on earth. Lay up treasures in heaven where moth won't rot it out. Where thieves won't break through and steal. We can gain durable treasures in heaven. We can gain honor from the one whom, from whom it really matters. For God himself. If we heed the cry of wisdom. Verse 19 tells us, in case there was any doubt before, wisdom, wisdom's value is better than gold and its revenue exceeds that of fine silver. Revenue. Bringing in Wealth. What are the wages of sin? Death. What's the wages of wisdom? Honor. Durable riches. Better than silver. Verses 20 and 21 tells us that we should travel with wisdom down Righteousness Street and right down the middle of Judgment Boulevard. The promise result in our lives is filled treasuries. That is, our heavenly treasures will be stuffed full. Another value of wisdom is that the wise are blessed. That is, the wise are given glory and enjoy God's grace and favor. Psalm 1.3 tells us that those who are blessed by God are fruitful trees that always produce fruit. 
The blessed of God are told that their works will prosper. Deuteronomy 8.18 states that God blesses his people with the power to get wealth. Isaiah 3.10 promises that the righteous will eat the fruit of their doings. And this is both a temporal promise and an eternal promise. Because that same verse, in, in same passage in verse 11, says, Woe to the wicked. Why? For the reward of his hands shall be given unto him. What's the reward of his labor? The reward of his life? The reward of all his doings? Hellfire forever. What's the reward of wisdom? Riches and honor and glory with God. Read the Beatitudes. Jesus spends, what, three chapters listing all the blessings of promise to the wise. Things like inheriting the earth, inheriting the kingdom of God, crowns of righteousness. The wise are blessed. In 30, verses 34 and 35, the wise listen to wisdom and find life in God's favor. Jesus said that he came that we might have life and that more abundant. He gives eternal life. Turn, if you would, back to Proverbs chapter 3. I'm almost done. Proverbs chapter 3. Remind me not to bring this Bible to a sword drill. Now let's pick it up in verse 13. Happy. That's blessed. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Why? Verse 14. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all things that thou canst desire are not to be compared with her, unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. What's the conclusion? Well, let's look back at our passage again. Still picking up in 34. Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, watch, waiting at the posts of the doors. For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. Wow. Eternal life and favor from God. That's, that's pretty good. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All that hate me love death. You know, Paul tells us that today is the day of salvation. He says to seek God while it's still today. Scripture tells us that there will be coming a day when it will be too late. Don't have time to read the passage, but Proverbs chapter 1, verses 24 through 33 gives a solemn warning that wisdom's crying out, and if you ignore her long enough, when you go to seek her later, you won't find her. Wisdom promises that if we seek her while she's calling, we will find her. We need to seek wisdom. We need to show others. We need then to show others wisdom in our lives and our words. Wisdom's crying out. Let's heed her call. Let's pray together. Father, we thank thee for thy word and its power. Father, I pray that my stumbling words might bring glory to thy name, that we might be built up together in you. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name.